And because we're bad at multitasking, it's hard to pay attention to what's happening in the chat and what's happening on the screen. And, you know, look at me, Ooh, you don't have to do that. Um, and then also go into the activity sheet and do things. That's, that's asking a lot. So um, whatever works well for you, sometimes some people choose to just hang out in the activity sheet and just listen to what's happening um, in the Blackboard Collaborate Ultra space. All right, welcome Tom. And it is 106, so I'm gonna get started and say, um, one, welcome to the Active Teaching Lab. This will be the first one of the semester. Happy first day of semester to you all. And um, I hope it all goes as smoothly as it can in regardless of what your situation is, whether you're remote, fully remote teaching or whether you're on campus teaching in those um, physically distanced classrooms and learning environments. Um, good luck to you. The theme of today's lab is flexible course design. And the idea of the flexible course design is um, things are gonna change, right? They already have changed quite a bit and they're gonna continue to change probably, right? And even if they don't change officially by campus policy, um, what you do in your classroom and your learning environment is going to change as the semester goes on and you have different students that are in different situations and you are in different situations because um, who knows what's going to happen during when flu season comes or after Thanksgiving when everybody goes fully remote. Um, there's a lot of a lot of options, a lot of opportunities for things to go terribly wrong or things to go eh, well enough. Um, and the way that we can best prepare, I think, is, um, well, that's what we're going to talk about today. And I'm, if you've never been to an active teaching lab before, this is not a training session. We do not have a canned curriculum where it's like, all right, everybody first do this, then do this, then do this. And at the end, you're going to come out with a, little, a nice little product or, or design. Um, Instead, we try to be responsive to your questions and your concerns, your needs. Um, we have tried to anticipate what you um, might ask and put all sorts of things available um, in the activity sheet. And I'm gonna start sharing the activity sheet here with you. Um, so if you get to the activity sheet, you can see that we have some overall tips here in the strategies for teaching in a pandemic. And then you have this table of um, crowdsourced flexible course design tips, obstacles, and solutions. And the way that this works, um, instead of having you type your questions into the chat in Blackboard Collaborate, because that is sometimes not a persistent, like if you leave Blackboard Collaborate and then you come back, it looks like nobody said anything in chat and you can't scroll up and see what was there. So instead, we try to capture all this stuff um, questions that people ask on that left-hand column of the table on the activity sheet. Now, there's also a right-hand column. So if you have ideas, um, somebody asks a question on the left-hand side, um, and you're like, oh, I know the answer to that JHG question, you can type in the answer on the right side or an answer, recognizing that there are a lot of questions that have multiple answers and even our best answers might be wrong so, or might not, they might be great for you, but they might not be great for somebody else. And this brings me to another um, really exciting part about the Active Teaching Lab. Because we get people from all over um, campus involved, there's an opportunity to learn from other folks. Um, and things that might work in one discipline might not work in another discipline. So keep that in mind. On the other hand, things that work in one discipline might work in another discipline if you sort of take the kernel of it and remix it um, to fit your classroom. So, all right, Scott Scott says in chat that this morning one of his students has informed him that he's now in quarantine and that's even before the course has started. Nice. Um, yeah, things are changing already and they're changing for your students. And oftentimes we don't know the situations that our students are in. So whatever we can do to sort of make our courses good for um, 
a, a larger group of students, um, the better. All right. And I'm going to share that link one more time for the activity sheet for the people who are just joining. Um, let's see. OK. And so we have the questions there. Excellent. And then below the questions, we have a bunch of other resources that we've sort of anticipated that you might have some use for. Um, very easy things to do. Um, and we have some more difficult things. So if, if you don't know where to start, start with the easy stuff. If you've already done some of those, move on to the next level, the medium ones. Um, oftentimes, we'll have a challenge level here. I, I don't think we have one here yet. But the challenge, oh, there it is. Um, sometimes the challenge ones are really complicated, and we don't have very easy answers for them. So um, if you know the easy answers for them, let us know on that. All right, I want to start off now and, and make a space uh, for folks to raise their hands um, and, or unmute themselves and ask any questions in case you don't feel like um, typing right now or you have something really important to say or even somewhat important to say. Um, what are your concerns about joining a campus situation the first day of fall semester where um, this is the first time any of us have done this? Um, so what are your concerns? And I'll give people a little bit of time to raise their hand or unmute. All right. No questions here? All right, no questions from the audio. All right, Nicole has a question that she's uh, asked in chat. Can we just join these active teaching labs uh, through the Canvas course, or do we need to register for each one separately? Um, you could just join. However, we are, have been asked to track. Um, who comes and who signs up for the and where they're from on campus. Um, these are questions that the uh, provost's office wants us to collect so that they know that we're reaching people on campus. So our preference is um, that you please do register um, because in Blackboard Collaborate, um, sometimes it doesn't capture who the people are or where they're from. It just, it just gives um, very basic information, especially if you joined as a guest participant and you can really put down any question that or any um, name that you want. So it's harder for us to, to, to do that. All right. Thank you, Nicole. Any other questions from folks? All right. So then I, we can just start digging into, well, here, let me, let me do a little introduction in here with this part. I want to talk through this strategies section before we start um, into the questions. So, oh, I didn't even finish this one. Look at that. I left a hanging sentence. That's terrible. Well, point number one, use the frameworks. So you'll hear this a lot in the active teaching labs. I'm a big fan of the Wisconsin experience because it takes sort of a, a, a campus initiative. Um, and if you're not familiar with the Wisconsin experience, it's the idea that students and, and actually staff and faculty as well should at UW-Madison um, develop their empathy and humility. Uh, they should develop their relentless curiosity and their intellectual confidence and their purposeful action. And if you think about those four things, um, they're all things that we want our students to have because we want those uh, traits with our peers, our professional peers. So regardless of your discipline, you want you know to work with people that are confident, um, that ask questions and are curious about things. Um, you want them to be driven and passionate about what you, they're doing. And you want them to um, have some empathy and humility that they don't know all of the answers, because none of us do. And they don't have all the perspectives. Um, and I think that that, so those four things, if we can really focus on working on those in classes, 
um, that would be great. Now, the cool thing about this is you're already doing a lot of this, right? You are trying to promote um, in your discussions um, some sense of etiquette uh, and civility, um, some sense of, hey, students, you don't have all the answers. You're here to learn. So open up that, you know, level of humility and um, and keep asking questions and stay curious and, and, and all of those things. So the Wisconsin experience and um, is, is one framework that you can use for that. Uh, Universal Design for Learning um, is a great framework for designing courses that are very flexible. Uh, we will have conversations about UDL and um, accessibility and inclusive, uh, inclusive course design um, later on in the semester, different labs. But those are all things that you can just latch on to. And again, you're already doing a lot of them. It's just a matter of doing a little bit more of what you're doing and a little bit less of the things that you might be doing that aren't, that don't align with that. So the next point is enlist the students. And this is really a big one. So as Scott said earlier, you know, this morning one of his students informed him that he's now in quarantine. You need, you might not, they might not step out to you and, and let you know about that. You might need to ask them. You might need to say, what is your situation like in quarantine and how can the course respond to you? Now, again, you don't have to do this by yourself. You can enlist other students to, to help them out because they will want to help each other. Students like being useful um, for each other, right? It builds that social capital and it also builds relationships. And a lot of our students are here because they want to build these relationships. And that's harder to do in a physically distanced and remote um, situation on campus. So figure out ways to let your students sort of lead in, in some ways. The other point about this is your students are in a lot more courses than you are. They are seeing a lot more um, things that instructors are doing than you can. You might be able to have conversations with people that are in your cohort, um, in your discipline, in your office, um, department, but they're seeing things across different departments. They're having conversations with other students of, you know, their, their colleagues, their peers saying, oh, my instructor did this really cool thing in class. And they'll be like, oh, I wish mine did that. Well, you might be able to do that if you ask them and you know what that is. So ask your students. Be kind, one, put the air oxygen supply on yourself before you help the person that you're sitting next to. So that's a, that's a big part of it. Be kind to yourself and be kind to your students because it's just, the situation is weird right now and you can't see what it's like for your students. Um, your students are in different situations. Some of them are working, uh, at least your remote students, you don't know what their situation is like. If you're in a physical classroom, at least everybody there you know, is in an equal, equitable environment. I had to get there, um, but they're sitting in an air-conditioned room with good lighting, good internet, etc. They might not have that at home. They might have a lot of distractions at home, and oftentimes you don't know. So be kind, be flexible because of that. Um, be flexible with your deadlines and with your points. Um, Please stay away from the high stakes. Um, you must take the test in one hour and it's worth 30% of your grade because if they have a computer crash or if what happened to me at 12.30, I clicked on up security updates on my computer and it said it was gonna take 38 minutes. And I was like, it can't take 38 minutes. I have to be live at one o'clock. That might happen. Who knows when that'll happen? And then be inclusive. And you, again, ask your students um, to help you do this. All right. Any questions on any of those? And I will take a slow drink of coffee. All right. Then on to the questions. So. First question, to record or not record? All right, so synchronous, well, I guess this is all of them. Uh, recording lectures, 
for asynchronous learning is good, but then how do you fit in, how do you create a community out of that? Uh, just a mix of the two, really good question. And we have, there's a really good answer already. It's built on doing and it's, uh, the, the community is built on doing with others. So group projects are really good for um, doing with others. Group projects are traditionally hated by students, right? Because, you know, you've got to arrange a time to meet and there's always one student that doesn't do, uh, you know, their fair share or maybe two or maybe three. Um, there are students that sort of take over and lead in directions that you don't want them to lead. Um, so it's tricky, but it's also, again, thinking back to the Wisconsin experience, a great opportunity for people to learn and practice, apply their empathy and humility, their relentless curiosity, intellectual confidence and purposeful action. So that's something that if you let your students know that this is part of it, it's not just create a project, but it's learn to work together to create a project. That is, that's one way to build, uh, to create the community. Back to the question about recording lectures. I think that recording lectures fits in really well with this idea of um, being flexible and, and being, um, being kind to your students' different schedules. Um, if you are forcing them to pay attention to you um, at the time, uh, that's, you know, some of them are going to, are going to miss out or somebody's dog is going to start barking and they're going to have to go off camera in order to take care of that. And then they'll miss that as well. So um, I did remember to record this session. And if you want to go back and share a section of it with your um, colleagues, or if you want to go back and review a section because I was speaking too fast or whatever, you will be able to do that. And I, you know, I hope that you do. Now, one of the things that we don't do here that we recommend for your lectures is to break those lectures down into very small chunks, right? Um, under 10 minutes, six to eight minutes, people say, um, I always like them even smaller, like it, take one idea and one video. And can you explain that idea in three minutes and then ask the students to check on, in on that? So I think the, the smaller, the better. Um, students are used to, um, many of them, the TikTok videos, very short. Um, and they can convey a lot in that short amount of time. So the smaller the video, uh, the less of a problem you'll have uploading those videos, et cetera. Okay, any other questions about that? I see that Karen says, uh, if the pandemic has taught her one thing, collaboration is essential. Absolutely. And collaboration tools have gotten so much better. Um, and instructors and students are finally starting to explore some of those because they have to. We are forced to use Blackboard Collaborate, me. Um, and I'm getting better at it. You know, slowly but surely, I'm getting better at it. So that's a useful thing. And your students are as well. All right, any other questions about that one or, or have we covered it? I see there's more going in on the right hand side and that's awesome. Um, please keep on adding ideas. All right, the next one then is how to accommodate students who are in various time zones. All right, again, this is for synchronous, I imagine, right? Um, because you have to be in this same time zone in order to, or different time zones in order to have that problem. Um, this is where asynchronous discussions or online forums are great, right? Um, I'm not a big fan of the online forums because, and you, the students in general are not either, right? Students, if they had their druthers, they would like to meet face to face um, and like to see each other in the classroom. They'd like to see all of their students up on screen. Blackboard Collaborate doesn't let you do that. Um, Zoom, I believe, does. Teams lets you see several of them. Um, I don't know what the limits are on those, and we're not going to talk about that. But we like to see each other's faces. And part of that need that we have to sort of um, have other people's faces is why I ask you to um, change your generic gray avatar into a, a headshot so that I can see what you look like um, and be like, oh, now I, it just helps me understand who it is that I'm dealing with. And it makes 
people a little bit more human than a, a, a string of letters that indicates a name. Um, I think that as humans, we're sort of programmed to um, use faces and to see faces and to recognize faces. So that in online discussions really helps. It also helps us check ourselves as we add to the discussion um, so that instead of seeing, oh, I'm just a, a gray avatar, I'm sort of anonymous, it's like, oh, no, I'm, I've got my name here and I've got my face here. They know who I am. I don't want to be a jerk, so maybe I will check myself and be a little bit more kind in, in a response or turn off the, the little voice that says, be snarky, be snarky. Um, those are ways to, to do that. As far as synchronous sessions go, it's tough. Um, we had uh, an instructor who would tune into us every week from Indonesia. And he was, it was like three o'clock in the morning for him. Um, a lot of your instructors who are in different time zones, incredibly different time zones, well, all different time zones, they adapt, right? Um, so that that's one way for them to, to sort of work with that. But the less synchronous you, the fewer synchronous things that you require, the easier it will be for them. Um, thoughts or questions? Again, we've got some great ideas here as well. So yeah, having having a little bit more flexible submission deadlines uh, would be good. Um, and I didn't even know that there was a tutorial for students. Maybe somebody, Lisa, maybe somebody, Lisa, or somebody else can figure out how to find that. Cool. Any other questions on that um, time zone question? All right. I feel like I often do a lot of talking here, and I invite you all to jump in and join in if you have ideas. If you hear something that you're like, oh, that doesn't sound right, please, I invite you to come back in and, and uh, respond to me. That would be great. However, I do recognize that one of the things that having a Google Doc lets us do is it lets us, um, it opens up an opportunity for people to participate um, in a way that doesn't require them to unmute and speak out loud because that can be intimidating for some people. All right, advice for instructors um, to avoid the common problems. All right, yeah, what? <laughs> common problems for the remote blended learning. How many people have ever had common problems? Go ahead and type in chat what some of those problems are that people have, and then we can um, we can start responding to that as well. Wi-Fi issues, really good one. Um, I'm at home, my wife teaches piano um, online now, so sometimes uh, my Wi-Fi will hiccup out because she's doing something bandwidth intensive thing at the same time that I'm trying to. So yeah, um, and I get kicked out of Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, so that's a big one as well. In Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, uh, as I would mentioned earlier, the chat is not persistent. So if somebody does get kicked out, when they rejoin, they lose everything in chat. So you'll have to repaste, uh, for example, a link to the activity sheet um, every once in a while in order to give those students those directions and so they don't feel like they're left out in a room. So that's a big one. Allison says that she saw a lot of Zoom issues over the summer, um, not knowing how to enter or exit from breakout rooms. Breakout rooms is a really good one. It's complicated, right? And they're different on the different platforms. So Zoom has breakout rooms that you can enable. Uh, Blackboard Collaborate has breakout rooms. Uh, Microsoft Teams has channels. I think WebEx has breakout rooms. Does WebEx have breakout rooms? I think they do. But it's different. Like how to do that is different for each one. So a thing that you will probably want to do is offer a bit of consistency, right? And give people extra time the first time and the second time, 
really step them through. Once they've done it a few times, they'll catch on, right? We get used to things if we do them a couple of times. If you use a different platform every week, it's going to be confusing and you're going to need that a lot of time, um, extra time for every single session. Um, and let me just say, special welcome to the Delta Leveraging Technology to Teach class that's joined us today. Um, one of the ideas that I have is to use a different platform every week um, to confuse you and so that we can compare and contrast um, some of the different things. So that can be a lot of fun um, if we let it be fun or it'll be really frustration, hopefully a good mix of both. So good. All right, Sarah asks how and where to, how and where to ask questions and communicate with the instructor. So do you use email and have your Outlook whisk.edu email box um, explode with the same question from 500 different students that you have to answer individually. And my suggestion is don't let yourself fall for that. Um, you can use the Canvas inbox and use announcements. Piazza is a, I have a, an instructor, one of the brilliant, most brilliant ideas that I had ever heard was the instructor says, students, if you have a question, put it on Piazza. And that way, all of the students can see that question, and I only have to answer it once. And that instructor said his inbox was, or his email is, you know, uh, lovely and clear of all of these questions that the students had in. Um, you can do the same thing in discussions in Canvas. Uh, you can do the same thing with announcements, I, I guess. So there, or the inbox. Um, it, it's it's a good way to do that. All right, um, Allison suggests a, a tech lead every day, one of the TAs who managed breakout rooms. And here again, you can have your students do that, right? If you are teaching a class by yourself and it's hard for you to pay attention to what you're lecturing synchronously and also see what's happening in chat. And when you go check your chat messages, you forget where you are on um, in your lecture. That happens to me a lot. Have your, enlist your students and say, hey students, answer each other's questions in chat. Or this week, uh, Marjean is going to be the student who um, answers the questions in chat. And if there's a theme that's happening in the chat boxes, so chat side over there, that is really important, Marjean has the ability to raise her hand and interrupt me or unmute herself and interrupt me. So I'll make her a participant, I'm a presenter or a moderator, um, so she can do that. And then next week, I'll assign that to somebody else. Let your students do that. It gives them a chance to sort of take ownership of the course themselves as well. So that helps. Um, all right. So Christopher asks, if the students are presenting, um, how do you do that? And what does it look like on their end? So this is a really good question that requires um, some experimentation. Um, now, the nice thing about all of these um, applications, um, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, Zoom, Teams, WebEx, whatever, they all let you get make somebody else a presenter. And they don't have to be somebody from UW-Madison. So you can text your best friend and say, hey, join a, join a Zoom meeting with me. I need to try some things out, you know, or two people, and have them try it out and do that exploration. And try it out with your students as well. Um, take some time at the beginning of class and say, um, let's all get familiar with this. Again, add that extra time at the very beginning of the semester so that the students can learn these things. And then later on in the semester, they won't have to. All right, Sam adds a really good point about creating boundaries um, with a colleague uh, who had students contacting them at all hours. Um, yes, yeah, even as a remote instructor, you have you have the ability to say I will try to respond to you within 24 hours, or I am off email because I am practicing self care and getting away from the screen um, between this time and that time, so I will not be able to answer you at those times. Um, another really great practice is to put in your syllabus and remind the students regularly. Please check three sources before you send me an email. Is it in the syllabus? Ask your other students if they saw it somewhere or know about it. And what was the third one? I forgot what the third one is. Um, 
Sid shared some uh, shared instructional continuity course activities. I think that there was something there about it. Um, but you can have them check three different sources. Uh, I think it was a Piazza forum or a discussion forum um, before that, or the assignment, or reread re re through the assignment. And that way the students won't just be like, oh, I don't know where to go. I'm going to email the instructor because that's easiest. No, they have to check three sources first. All right. Thank you, Sid, for sharing those, uh, communicating with um, students on the instructional continuity wisc.edu site. And we can actually put that in uh, on the right hand side of that document there as well. All right. Okay. So Peter asks, and are these being put on the right on the table here as well? Let me add it to the table. And then I'm going to get down to it in a little bit. All right, so Peter, I added your question to the table here. And we'll get to it in just a little bit. All right, let's go back to the, are there any other questions about sort of the common, um, common problems in this environment? And again, I invite you to unmute and spare my voice. You're cruel not doing that. Okay. Prioritizing learning outcomes or expectations. How do we adjust? Um, how do we prioritize learning outcomes or expectations to adjust for the achievement constraints imposed by the quarantine? Whoever put that question in there, can you explain a little bit what your what you mean by achievement constraints? My name is Javier, and um, I'm a PhD uh, student in mechanical engineering. Um, what I intended with that question was more on a generic perspective of that we don't have as much time in contact of uh, in person, and so uh, probably students would not have the opportunity to ask um, as frequent questions as they used to, um, uh, even if it's just after class or during regular office hours. Um, and so for that reason, I thought that maybe learning constraint, I'm sorry, uh, learning outcomes might be constrained for them to be um, as effective as they used to be in person. Uh, maybe not, but uh, yeah, my question was to address that fact, yeah. Great, and I think that this is a, a, a really good question. Again, we don't know what's happening in a lot of their lives right now, right? We don't know their the situation of their their, their own classroom with, internet access or, you know, are they in the parking lot with three kids of the parking lot of the um, local small town library with three kids in the backyard who are or the back seat who are also working off of the Wi-Fi hotspot at the library. Um, we just don't know. So how can, how does this affect our expectations of them? One of the things, and I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because it gets me this uh, chance to um, highlight the second thing, which is turn the pandemic deficit into a rare learning opportunity. So how many of you had thought um, or have heard people say, oh, this is going to be a terrible semester. I'm never going to be able to get, you know, the stuff that I, that I always teach done in this semester um, because usually I have to have this special situation in order to do that. So here's the way to flip that around. Your students this semester have a rare opportunity to address whatever the content is in a pandemic. And that is affecting all businesses right now, right? So whatever your discipline is, your discipline is learning how to do their discipline in a pandemic. None of your previous classes, none of your regular classes that you've taught the same for years and years and years, and I'm not saying you did, but perhaps, can say that. Your students this year have that as an opportunity that is an authentic opportunity that the world is facing right now. It's kind of special. It's 
terrible, but it's also like they will learn stuff that none of your other students have learned before because they are, will be thinking about, well, how do I apply this in a pandemic? Let that change your learning outcomes. Let that change their outcomes as well. Um, and give them a little bit of time to do that, to think about, well, how do I learn in this situation? You know, the idea of metacognition. AJ, go ahead. Hi, yeah, so my name is AJ Daughtry Krill. I work in academic technology with a pre-college high school program. So uh, we've been thinking about this all summer and I've been thinking about this a ton, just personally. Um, the big thing, um, I, I can't agree more with John in terms of it's such a unique situation. And so um, I've had to really think hard about like, what actually do I need students to do? Um, scaling back as much as possible to leave some breathing room and um, <clears throat> um, making, it, making the pacing a little bit different. Uh, so thinking about pacing the course in terms of, you know, sometimes there's heavier parts of a course and lighter parts and I'm trying to pace things so that nothing's too light and nothing's too heavy. Um, and, then and again, you can, you can ask your students, right? Check in on with your students on whether last week or this last session that we did mm -hmm. was too intense or, whether, or were they bored? So ask, give them those pulse surveys. Good. I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt, but. No, that's OK. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, and the last thing I was going to say was I try to have an easy early assignment um, right away because and I know this doesn't apply to everyone, but it definitely applies to me and my work. But um, it just helps me to know like who actually did get into the course and can interact with it and submit something um, specifically in Canvas, but in any format. So um, that really helps to kind of key me in to like who's completely missing, who's there right away, and who's kind of um, catching up as we go along. Great. Let me amp amplify that last point that you made about the um, the quick uh, the quick short um, low stakes assignments. Really great idea um, for all instructors to the first time that you do something, make it very low stakes because the low stakes assignments, if they mess it up, oh well, it's only been a it's only a point or two. So there is some consequence for not doing it or for forgetting it or for goofing it up terribly. Um, and maybe there shouldn't be any, but they get a chance to sort of not think if they mess it up. So that removes so much of the stress. And it also helps you sort of see who's having trouble with this, who's not having trouble with this. Again, oftentimes you can't see the faces. Um, so that's, a, that's an issue. Sorry, All right. I, thought and, of, I thought of one more, ahead. John. Um, I'm blanking on what the technical term is for this, but I think it's like uh, puzzle piecing or something like that. But I've been relying on that more in terms of students picking up topics that I wanted to cover anyway, and then them doing some of their own research and yeah, jigsaw. presenting to each other. Jigsaw, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yep, and that's, that's another great one. Again, enlist your students to do the research themselves and find out about the course content themselves. The internet is a huge place and there's good stuff out there and there's bad stuff out there. And one of the skills that we all want our students to learn is how to be able to tell the difference between the good and the bad. And one way to do that is to have them actually go out and do that. Um, and then share it with each other because they might find something that you didn't know about or that inspires another student of theirs. So those are good. I see in the chat we've got some questions on designing a pulse survey and Thank you, Karen Spader. Is She's the queen of pulse surveys. Um, they're simple, they're short, um, and it's, they're very easy to, to do. Um, so thank you for sharing those. Uh, look in the chat for that. Great, and Allison's got one too. Awesome. Thank you all. OK, next question. How to be flexible without it being overbearing for the instructor or the students? Yeah. Um, all right, some tips here. Uh, three 24-hour late penalty-free submissions. So adding that flexibility. Um, class tokens, 
same sort of idea, um, giving them that free pass for those um, for those times when they just can't deal or they 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 something happens. Um, lower stakes assessments. Um, one of the instructors um, that I really admire has five assignments every week. So that's a lot, right? But they're very simple assignments. Um, and they're low stakes. So if the students forget them or something comes up, they lose two points. It's not that big of a deal. This instructor also lets them work ahead. So if somebody has a chronic condition or a recurring issue that they have to deal with, they can do, they can work ahead and get a couple of things banked up um, so that they don't fall behind. Um, that that's the kind of flexibility that will really help a student um, without adding extra work for you. I should say for that instructor that has those five assignments, not only are they easy assignments for the students to do, but they're like, uh, I think she has a, a four point scale, zero, they didn't do it at all. One, they did it, but didn't put any thought into it. Two, they did a, a average job on it. And three, they did a great job on it. So very easy for her to scan and be like, three, one, three, one, two, two, you know, whatever. Um, so that's sort of a, a, a nice a nice way to do that. All right, invite students to contribute to synchronous discussions by chat as well as by audio. All right, and that's what we're doing here. There's stuff happening in the chat box. That's great. Students are, many students are great at texting and they don't want to talk. I get it. Um, I like to talk too though. though. All right, assign the students to be official note takers for each class session and Something like sharing this Google Doc that I'm sharing with you is another way um, to give the students some sort of tangible document that they can um, take notes on. Um, and you can put prompts in there and um, then just share out that um, Google Doc with a slash copy trick where you have the URL that you share out, but instead of slash edit at the end, you take out slash edit and you put in slash copy, and that will um, give the student a chance to make their own version of it uh, without ha them having to be like, oh, make a copy of this file, whatever, whatever. They just click on the link and it says, do you wanna make a copy? Yeah, make a copy. Um, and maybe we'll have some information on that there as well. All right, let me just look at chat real quick. All right, and we're on the pulse surveys, great. If you make available recorded synchronous sessions, does this tempt students to not participate in the synchronous session, but instead watch the recordings and thereby circumvent any Wi-Fi or other issues that they're dealing with? Really good question, um, uh, Peter, that you uh, ask there. And I think that one way to, you need to make the synchronous spe sessions special some way, right? Um, so that they can ask questions in it. Um, oh, great, Javier is putting in a, a follow-up question. But yeah, if they if they need to watch the synchronous sessions, and I'm saying if they, um, does it tempt them to, to not participate? Uh, some of them it will uh, tempt them, but others um, it, it might not uh, so much. But if they need to take advantage of it, they can take advantage of it. So that's a, oh, that's a good uh, good response that somebody put in here. For students that aren't available to attend to synchronous sessions, I'm going to have a follow-up activity uh, where they review work done by other students during synchronous sessions. Right, so if in your synchronous session, you have um, breakout groups for your students, for example, the ones that log in afterwards, they can't be part of that. So they've missed out on that participation. All right. Karen Spader, I want you to jump in and and emphasize the point uh, about weighted grading. Thank you, I, I missed that. Lux. Oh, no, we heard you. We heard you say whoops. Oh, you did? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, so we can hear you. You can hear me? I can. It says it's muted. It's a miracle. Okay. 
All right. Uh, so about weighted grading, right. Um, you were talking about like you were giving the example of the person who had five assignments a week. Yes. Uh, so <clears throat> it struck me that weighted grading is really the way to go uh, because it gives you so much more flexibility and being able to have, um, you know, add an extra assignment. You, when teaching online, uh, one big thing is, is like a quiz for every module or something to that effect, right? But mm -hmm. yeah. And when they're when you're using weighted grading and you say all quizzes are 15% of your grade, then you can add them and drop them if you find a place where you go back and go over more or mm -hmm. whatever it might be. Um, but you do have a lot of assignments in a remote in an online teaching environment. You should. It, it's your way of checking understanding. It's their way of giving you feedback. Uh, that's content relevant. And so that means the traditional approach to points where we often put all of the points in a syllabus, it becomes impossible and a mounting task. And so anyway, that was the point I wanted to make. It really is more flexible for you too, uh, as you can add and adjust and make changes on the fly and not mess with your grading. Yeah, Nicole, it's not too late, right? You still have time, right? Um, yeah, the weighted grading would have saved time. Yes, yeah, all right, do it. And it's it's a fairly easy thing to do to create an assignment group called quizzes and say that every you know not every quiz is worth X percentage and then you have to add up those points or whatever. But you say all of the quizzes are worth 15%, and then you can, as as Karen points out, you can add or or remove those as you want. Um, and I want to really amplify that. Um, her other point about being careful that you're not adding, making it a course and a half, and we all know what that is, right? Where it's like, oh, I can add more things just with this extra link. Boom, there's more stuff to do. Because um, that will kill the students, <laughs> right? That will, they'll hate, they'll hate you for that. But if you balance that with these are low stakes and they're, they don't take up as much time, it's important that you credit the students for the amount of time that it takes. Um, but to Karen's point, without sort of that face-to-face -face, um, feedback loop that they get from talking with their neighbor students that they're sitting next to um, and looking over the shoulder to see, you know, are other people getting this because I'm not getting this, um, getting your feedback, it's hard for you to know what they're catching and not catching and hard for them to know, are, am I getting it? Do I understand what my instructor is saying? Or do I just think that I do? Um, and these assessments let us do that. Um, but again, give them credit, make them low stakes. All right. All right, uh, Javier asked the question about, um, do you value this the same as the build on activity by those that could not attend? Um, and how do you assimilate the value? Um, one of the things that Universal Design for Learning will do is, is suggest that you have multiple means of engaging the students, of representing the material, and multiple means to let them um, show their mastery and understanding of the work. So ideally, yes. You, you can give different people different ways um, to participate. And some, you don't have to like come up with a personal plan for every student. Um, you can come up with one rubric and say, here's what the expectations are, however you meet them. And it doesn't have to be a paper, it doesn't have to be a, a breakout group, it doesn't have to be a whatever, but it's up to you. I like, I will give you these spaces to meet them in the way that I expect you to. But if you want to go a different way and meet those expectations, you can. Now, obviously, your expectation cannot be you must attend the breakout room or you must write a paper because that changes everything there, right? That doesn't let them do that. Um, but if they can meet those expe expectations um, in other ways, that's great. And it's no extra work for you because it's on them to show that they've done that, to make that case. And if there are questions, they can um, jump in on that. They can talk to you about that. 
All right. Do I have to be actively teaching? Of course, to take this, uh, the active teaching lab. No. Come on in and uh, we'll have these sorts of conversations every week. Um, and you're welcome to jump into them um, for planning, for future work, for helping your friends who are teachers. Um, that's all that is valid. All right, how do we check in regularly with students? All right, so in many ways, we've already talked about that with a pulse survey, um, and that's great. We're done, this is good. We've, we've made all of those, um, we've answered all of the questions, unless Peter adds another one there. So just to go over, um, remember that this is an opportunity, and remember to let your students lead and listen to your students and ask them questions about what they're doing in other courses um, and steal those ideas that work for you and work for them, of course. Um, build a community and you can do that with tricks like breakout groups, let them talk to each other um, in small, more intimate ways than just everybody in one uh, large participant list just chatting on the side. Uh, profile pictures in Canvas. Add a profile picture to your profile in Canvas and have your students do that. That way they show up in the discussion forums there, um, both as a picture and their name. Um, create a space that is sort of led by student questions. So if you create it, let them post there and ask each other questions. Frequent announcements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I already talked about getting tips from students. Um, frequent communication, scaffolding, so that um, long-term projects are good. Start off with the little kernels of it and build off of that kernel to do the next thing and the next thing so that they keep going back to that initial assignment. This is really good in educational um, psychology. This is distributed knowledge. Right, so this is, oh, I needed to go back and revisit this in order to, to do the thing that I need to do now. Um, and if you think about it in video games, what's the first thing you learned how to do? You learned how to run and jump. So once you get to level 88 or 5,000 or whatever level you're at, you still need to run and jump. And every day you are going back to that first thing that you learned and you're building off and you're using all of those things. Do the same thing in your course as well. Consistency and Predictable course rhythm. Course rhythm is important. Um, give students a chance to try things out and play with them and then re repeat that pattern. You can add new things every once in a while, but every class should not be, we're gonna try eight new things today because your students will be overwhelmed and so will you. All right, are there any other questions that people have We've got more information on the activity sheet. Yeah, Peter, go ahead. Um, John, I'm, I'm not sure that I understand exactly what you mean with the advantages of um, weighted grading. You know, I know what it is, but I, you know, like, so what's so special about it in an asynchronous um, online course, for example? I think one of the things was um, as a planning um, tool, it lets you add extra quizzes in if you need to without being, uh, you know, if you may, if you have 10 quizzes and each one is worth 1%, um, then if you add that 11th quiz, then you might, then, you know, your total points don't add up. So that would be one way um, to do that. Yeah, Vivian, so weighting, weighted grading is this idea that you can have all of the assignments in Canvas, and, and you'll learn about this um, in our Leveraging Technology to Teach class, um, and we can talk about it more there, but you can have all of your assignments be worth X number of percent, and all of your quizzes worth X number of percent, and all of your um, exams being worth you know a certain percentage. So it's a, it's a, um, it's a way to sort of build into that. Karen, you know this better than I do. You want to jump yeah. in? Yeah, I will. So I think for me, it's when I'm trying to just formulate my approach here. Um, so 
When you use points, a points-based grading system, one of the things that we like to do is have things have some cleanliness to them, right? So like your, your, your final grade isn't going to be out of 357, it's going to be out of 350 points, right? And we force ourselves into these spaces where, um, you know, each quiz needs to be 10 points then, and I can have, I have 10 quizzes. Um, but when we're online, and our topic today is about flexibility as well, uh, what if I have a module where I don't want the quiz to have 10 questions, I want it to have 20, 25 questions. This is, to AJ's point earlier, this is a heavier section of the course, um, and by a making those adjustments really quick um, or having the flexibility to make those adjustments requires flexibility in your grading system. So instead of having a total of 100 points for quizzes throughout your whole semester, because you have 10, 10 point question, 10 question, you follow me there, right? Uh, yeah. Now you can have 10 quizzes, different point values. It doesn't matter. Each quiz is still weighted equally. Um, and so setting all of that up in Canvas uh, is much more streamlined than having to keep with a certain point value that you say published in a syllabus. Could you just straight up change what the final points are then? Yeah, I mean, there's flexibility in that too. It's just easier for me, I think, in Canvas and the general way things get structured and laid out don't have to be equal. You don't have to worry about meeting a pretty cutoff line. Um, yeah, so that's really kind of what I mean. All right. Hey, it's 202. Thank you all for coming. You can go if you'd like to. Um, if you want to stick around, um, I'll be around for the next couple of, quest uh, couple of minutes to answer any other questions. Um, if you are part of our Leveraging Technology to Learn course that starts from, uh, well, this was the first hour of it, um, you get to take a break and come on back um, by 2.10 and we will jump in um, with our first course class session. And I see Mike Maddox is here. Excellent. Thank you, Mike, for coming. And uh, you stick around too, okay, Mike? All right. Special thanks to our moderators, um, Sid and Cliff and Karen. Um, thank you for helping jump in, answering questions both on the activity sheet and elsewhere. A reminder that that activity sheet will stick around. So. If you find it useful, keep referring back to it. Um, and thanks again. Take I'm going to take a little break. I'm going to take a little break, but I'm going to leave everything on here. So All right, bye-bye. I'm just going to do a little away thing, I guess. Hey, John, can you still hear me? Even though you did, I just wanted to point out the chat message. Seems like a question for you before you go. Um, yes, uh, okay. yes, Julia, uh, stay here. Okay, cool. See ya.
Hey, John, I want to make sure my microphone works. Mike, how are you? I can hear you. I yeah. am doing well. I have not been in uh, this webinar format in a while. Ah. You know, spoiled by Zoom myself. Yeah, okay. Um, are you, so if you are willing, I'd love to have you share your course. Um, if you want me to do the presentation of it or the, the screen sharing of it, I'm happy to do that. I just made you a moderator, so you could do that as well. Yeah, uh, let me do it. I've, I've got it prepared and things queued up to show. So my plan awesome. is, and if I can do a quick test run. Yeah, do it. Um, where was the share screen button? I forgot where um, that was at. The lower uh, right-hand corner is that content. little square. Yep, and I'll turn mine off. Oh my God, I used this all the time five years ago. And now... Well, five years ago it was Blackboard Collaborate, and now it's Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. Oh, I remember when it was Illuminate. Ooh. So, <laughs> uh, sure. so, all right, so, do -do -do. so oh, sure. I got to change preference here, it looks like. Uh, screen, application window, teaching. Uh, yeah, I think that's it, right? All right. Uh, I can't tell. Did something share or not? Not no. yet, but oftentimes right. it, it takes a, a minute to do so. Well, I think I also got prompted to change my settings to allow something, mm -hmm. and I didn't. <laughs> I didn't allow it, so... Let me, let me try that again. I'll stop. Stop sharing. John? Yeah. My name's Will Routes. I have a I question. I'm you. actually in the, in the tech to teach or yep. whatever we're calling it. And I'm a little confused because oh, the Delta course information and the, um, and the uh, course scheduler said the course met from one to two and then had um, asynchronous uh, work at other times. All right. In, and in early... Oh, you've got a two o'clock? Well, no, I don't have a two o'clock, but I have to pick kids up at 245. Okay. And, That's okay. And so we'll... this is... Yeah. We'll be flexible with that. So um, it's a... Originally, it was a like a two and a half hour course, and I thought there's no way that I can do, or, or any student should have to do two and a half hours of synchronous work because that's just too much. So my new thought was, and and I I didn't actually come up with this new thought until um, about August, and uh, I said, well, what if we did a uh, do the active teaching lab and then a short break and then just finish it up at, you know until three o'clock as long as the students who signed up initially it was from one to three um, so they had that sort of set for that time um, so that my hope was that people would have that sort of blocked off already um, yeah and I signed up in August and I didn't okay that wasn't there uh, as it was said one to two and then asynchronous and so I I can be flexible, but at least today it's going to be problematic. Next week we actually do have some other stuff going on that right. should be able to help. So but yes, and part of this class, and I'll, I'll I'll say this in a few minutes when we all come back here as well. Um, it's I recognize that y'all are busy, right? You've got stuff going on in your lives, and especially this semester, um, everybody's schedule is messed up. People are working from home, people have kids, people have other things happening. I'm going to try to be as, oh, yep. Uh, as I had a request from Mike to make him moderate. I'm looking for you. Mike Maddox, number two, make moderator. There you go. Um, so yeah, we will be flexible with that, that's fine. Um, Sometimes people can make it to classes, sometimes they can't. In past years, we would be like, uh, we'd have students that would be like, oh, I've got conferences uh, that I need to go to. Um, that probably won't be as big of a problem this year as it was in previous years, but instead we have a pandemic to deal with. So 
yes, I understand flexibility and it won't be a problem. Yeah. Okay, well, I will turn off mic and video again, but thanks. All right. And it's 2.11. Am I back? My status is back? Yes. So welcome back, everybody. Um, I will invite you, but not require you, to turn on your 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 um, video webcams um, if you are interested in doing so. Um, I will also ask that if you would please um, click on this My Settings and add a photo of yourself um, so that if we can't see you, at least we can um, have a picture of you and start to put your face um, and name together so that we, I don't know, start knowing each other as uh, more human than uh, anonymous avatars. The way to do that is to click on my settings on the lower right hand corner um, by that purple tab. If you click in the purple tab, you get the little gear icon and you'll see a, a my settings panel open up at the very top of it is that picture of the gray avatar. Um, it'll have your name next to it and probably be like your name and participant. If you click on that picture of the avatar, um, you'll get a prompt to upload an image or capture a photo from your camera um, and then save that. This is a little, this little checkbox that says always use this profile picture. It's a lie. It will not let you always use that profile picture because I think it's connected with cookies. So if you clean out your cookies every once in a while, you've got to refresh it and add it again. Um, so I just have a profile picture on my um, desktop that I just move in there every once in a while. I had to do that today as well. So, but that'll be that would be great if you could do that. And yeah, Stephanie, no worries. If you're on your work computer, um, that's okay. Um, we'll try to get people to eventually have those um, and or share your uh, webcam. Okay. Oh, about sharing your webcam. Not required. Um, and recognize that sometimes your students might be in situations where they don't want you to see the inside of their house, right? Because they might be embarrassed about their house. Um, they might have kids running around or dogs running around or or whatever the reason is. Um, so it's nice. Um, students prefer to see each other. Instructors, I think, prefer to see each other um, and the students. But sometimes yes, sometimes no. All right, let me bring everybody to, I've got Mike Maddox here, and um, Mike has volunteered to um, share with us. Uh, he was a student, was it last fall? Last fall. Last fall, and um, has, would come to the active teaching labs and uh, came to the course, and I, I thought, rather than have myself introduce and say, oh, this is a useful class or whatever, I would... Um, enlist somebody to come in and say, hey, it's a useful class and, and it really is good. Um, Mike will be, I think, brutally honest about how unstructured I am and I'm going to make that disclaimer myself. Um, I strive for structure, but um, I've got ADHD and I don't always do it so well. Um, so I will miss things all the time. Um, I will forget to publish modules or pages. Uh, sometimes the links that I have, I will have forgotten to double check them, um, come up with ideas out of the blue, like in the middle of a sentence. And um, I sometimes throw everybody off track by going down that route. Um, I want to be very open about that. Um, it might be frustrating. I am always happy to get feedback. And I forget sometimes that I'm doing that. So if you see me taking a tangent, call me back. Help me out. Um, it looks like everybody has gotten into just about everybody, except for Patricia and Sarah, um, have gotten into the course site. And so you've all seen the front page. The front page looks very organized, doesn't it? I'm really proud of that one. Um, and it's a facade, I'll tell you, because I'm not organized, but it looks organized, and that's half the battle. So I'm going to let Mike talk about his course, and because he's more organized than I am, and share his uh, thoughts on the course. 
um, and do be honest about you know how it was with them and I'll be able to recover. All right, go ahead, Mike. All right, well, I've been trying to share something with you, but I've not been on Collaborate in forever, and I think my one chance at allowing my system to grant uh, screen sharing capabilities, I missed. And now I'm um, trying to present in that. So John, I'm gonna let you try to figure out how in the hell do I share a screen? Otherwise, okay. my, my fallback option is, I've got a Zoom account, you're all welcome to my room. Um, <laughs> But let me just talk about John real quick. Um, me, I am very much a lawful neutral character type. And so to jump over to John's class, which he's a little bit more of a chaotic good type, I guess, um, it took me a bit of adjustment. And I have to say, I really appreciated to see a very different learning type. Um, it really pushed me to try some new things. And um, it was just like a nice breath of fresh air for me once I adjusted. Um, but I'm also pretty used to that. I'm an extension educator um, where we're not really tied to campus and the traditional learning that you all are engaged in. We're very much outreach and we work with the communities um, across the state um, to do educational outreach in a variety of ways. Um, and we'll talk about that more. Um, just to get you grounded in, in who we are and what we're doing. I'm not here alone either. Um, I am joined by Christine Ryback. Um, and Christine, if you just want to jump in and introduce yourself real quick. Sure thing. Hello, uh, I am Christine Ryback. I am with Educational Technology Support at, at um, Extension. And uh, Mike and I have been working through Canvas and making it available and doing a, a good job of the instructional design and the construction and things like that for all of our um, Extension educators, um, which we will be unveiling uh, really shortly. So we're going to have a plethora of new new folks in. Mike, so, Mike does a great job of leading the way. He's a cutting edge kind of person, and if it's new, Mike's doing it. Christine, can you um, answer John's questions while I'll just keep the things chugging along here? Um, sure. So first of all, extension. Are you familiar with it? And in the chat box, let me know. No, I'm not familiar with it. Or if you are familiar with extension, how are you familiar with it? This will get me grounded in what you know of us. So, and no is a per perfectly legit answer. It was for me at one point. So, yep. So, Extension is a part of the land grant university systems, um, with UW Madison being one of the land grant institutions, in which we are responsible for taking the education and knowledge that is generated within these traditional research institutions and taking it out to the communities across the state. Um, you'll talk about the Wisconsin idea, likely in this class, we very much are embodied in that. Um, we've been around since after war, uh, the Civil War, we were, um, the concept of the land grant institution was, was instigated by Lincoln. And then, let me correct that, in the early 1900s, um, extension came from these land grants and we're really county-based. Um, our, we are tied to the campus, but we're really about outreach out in the communities. I am in charge of the Master Gardener program. Have you heard of that? You may not know exactly what it is, but have you heard of it? Um, so that is my job is to train volunteers to work on behalf of UW-Madison Extension and through the topic of gardening, do community change. Now the program's over 40 years old. It began out in the Seattle area by an extension agent who was just overwhelmed with um, the gardening questions that was coming into a Seattle office. And rather than answering every one of these hundreds of questions that came in, he decided he was going to train volunteers to answer those questions using unbiased research-based information. And it was an over, Welming success. People, there was 200 people lined up uh, to take the course, and they got trained that first year in the mid 1970s. And you just fast forward to the early 80s, it was in nearly every state. And um, 40 years later, nationally, there's over 86,000 volunteers who contribute over 5.6 million hours of volunteer time doing gardening 
educational programs and continuing to answer these questions. So it's one of the largest volunteer programs in the US. In Wisconsin ourselves, we have um, 2,700 volunteers that do about 170,000 hours in garden-related activities that align with our educational priorities of food safety, protecting in the environment, community greening, and human health. Um, and this continues to be, and they continue to answer questions, but it's expanded to doing a lot of educational outreach classes, both formal and informal, and lots and lots of gardening projects that are aligned with their themes. Um, a couple things to point out just to set the tone here. We're not working with a traditional campus-based student population. We are dealing with individuals who fall into the lifelong learner category. Um, and with the Master Gardener program, they are typically of retirement age, white, female, educated, and of economic means. So we're working with a pretty narrow demographic that one of the things we're working with is diversity and that we're trying to address with some things we're doing. Um, as an organization, we've recently went through a reorganization and merger. That's another story, but it has brought us um, a new staffing model and resources that we have to address to address. And it also means we have new policy and procedures that really impact our program and we have to get everything in line. We are addressing a lot of risk management with, you know, you have thousands of volunteers running around the state acting on behalf of the university. Um, that gets risk management worried, so we have to take in a lot of things, a lot of things to consideration there, um, as well as just best practices and volunteer development um, need to be folded into the program. And it's through this effort that I'm going to show you um, what we're doing. So, John, any luck with uh, screen sharing? Yes, Christine's all ready to, to do it. <laughs> Thank right. you. As soon as you get done with the introduction, she can jump in. And all right. So, yep, there it is. Well, I was going to show a graphic, but screw it, I'm not. Um, what I wanted to do is say, when we talked about the course, it was primarily teaching people a lot about horticulture, about how to grow things, as you might expect. But what we've had to do to address some of this risk management and volunteer policy, it's to do a new onboarding course for our volunteers. And in this, Christine, if you want to go ahead and show the screen, that's fine. Um, we, go ahead and show it. Yeah. And, and I'll walk you through it as, as we do things. Oh, which, all right, hang on. Yeah, just show them the onboarding course. And then I'll walk you through parts of it. Yep. I've actually roughly scripted this out, again, a little bit more of that okay. personality type. Um, All right, do you, you see it, yes? Yes, we can see a module-based homepage. Okay, got yes, it. Thank you. Thank you. you. this one? Yeah, well, no, just, just stay on that for now, and I'll, I'll drive you. So, okay. um, so let me just... Be clear, this course I'm about to show you is not about gardening. <laughs> and, that, and last year in the course, as I was talking about that, people were like, what do you mean you're doing a Master Gardener course and not talking about gardening? No, this is primarily to address that risk management piece and best volunteer management piece that was missing from the program. Um, at the end of this, we'll talk a little bit about a gardening course we're putting online, but for now, this is much more of an HR, kind of an administrative type thing. Um, and it's to onboard volunteers. And, um, and by onboarding, it's to give them that required orientation and training on what it means to be, one, a representative of the UW system, two, to explain um, what the scope of their position is, three, to walk them through these requirements of uh, criminal background check, uh, youth protection, and um, some other things um, that are related so this to is onboarding. Totally this is not the kind of course that most of your student, most of most participants in leveraging technology to teach are going to be are going to be taking. And and the the cool thing about this is that you can design the course that you want to teach or the course that you have yeah. to teach. Um, so it's a right. Go on. Yeah. Well, and and that's it. It's like this is so out of the norm of what everybody else is coming to this course to teach. But it's like, I need to do this. I need to do it online. And this has such a potential for being a boring thing that it's like no it's got to be interesting it's got to be interactive it's got to be fun yeah we're talking about criminal background checks and and don't use flamethrowers and stuff like that but how can we make this fun and not boring so i went through the class last year and um learned a lot of things i had i, I as i'm actually looking 
looking right now on my computer uh, the 2019 fall activity labs that we did. And, per, and you know, pretty much anything in there that says Canvas, yeah, that was applicable to this class because I was on such a huge learning curve with using Canvas. Um, but backward design and the importance of having really crystal clear criteria for your goals and objectives. Um, the personalized learning to me was a huge learning thing, um, though I couldn't fold that as much into this course as I wanted to. I would say it has played a large role in my face-to-face -face and other programs that I do on what can I do to have individuals um, teach themselves and, and respect their own knowledge and um, have them apply what we're learning to their real life situations. Um, learning with Google, we're learning with Google. Um, this program is based very heavily in Pressbooks because I wanted the formatting and I wanted the H5P interactivity for that low stakes, no stakes quizzing and content reinforcement. Um, we've been really looking at what are inclusive teaching practices to get people to feel welcome and um, able to engage to their fullest ability in the class. Um, folding the uh, Wisconsin idea into the course, and I caught this last piece um, right as I as in the end of your active teaching lab, the universal design for learning. That has been probably the biggest thing I took out of the course last year, um, applying it to what I'm building both for this course and other courses, and um, just trying to embrace what that means. So Christine, if, if you are looking at the onboarding, um, let's just kind of start to look at some of the things here. Okay. So <clears throat> where would, just tell me what so, to click on. Yeah, I know, I, I just saw a comment. So uh, yes. To, yeah, so I was not teaching, it. it was brand new. And it was, and this is really outside of the box for um, traditional Master Gardener stuff. So um, still getting some colleagues to come on board, but we're getting there. So um, I'm going to start with the universal design for learning, and this really permeates throughout. So in this course, we attempted to give both ends of the digital literacy spectrum something they can interact with. Um, and that, to me, was the biggest takeaway with UDL was I have traditionally shot for that middle of the average participant. But I've had to wrap my brain around, well, what are the different extremes of my participants? And one part of for me is that digital literacy part. How comfortable are they with computers? So in this course, we're trying to give the two extremes. One is something kind of uh, with all the bells and whistles for somebody to interact with on their tablet. And at the other extreme, here's something you can print so you can have in hand and read. And right off the bat, you can see we have some optional print areas. And what we're doing is having all the content that's in the course also be available for something print on demand um, that people can use. In the future, this that's will likely example. roll into a book. But was that John? And that's an example of that's an example of universal design for learning. The idea of multiple means to um, have mm -hmm. your content in in one way. You don't have to do that, but that's one option here. And we'll yeah. talk more about that later, of course. Um, and that was, but that's the whole concept of shooting for those both ends of the spectrum and not shooting from the middle was really important for me to understand. Um, so we, like I said, we've got a lot built into Canvas and we're going to show you some of those bells and whistles. Um, though there is a print part, there will be things they will need to jump in and use the Canvas quiz features in order to, to participate, check the boxes and to move on. Um, other things that we found important rating, relating to UDL was, again, having those crystal clear learning objectives. What is it that you need to know? And we let them decide how they are going to get there. Are they going to read it? Are they going to, uh, in the print version, are they going to um, do the online version? We're working, our next step is deciding, do we need things as videos? Do, will they want to watch those videos? Um, um, but also it was really clear that helpful with having really clear objectives. And, and I, I want to point this out by having those clear objectives that backward design from the beginning. And we said, this is what it needs to do. When we were editing and had some other contributor contributors come to and say, we, Hey, what if you add this, 
we need to talk about that. Um, it gave us sort of a really easy ability to say, you know, that's a really good idea, but that's not part of the object objectives. And they were able to say, oh, okay, I get that. So it was able to, having those crystal clear objectives really allowed us to edit ourselves and make this program be very focused on what it needs to be. Um, other parts of UDL that, um, I don't think we're actually talking in class, but I picked up later. And maybe you, you know these. Um, how, many are, are, how many of you are familiar with plain language and that style of writing? If you're not, I really suggest you look it up. I just completed a four-week course on the introduction of how to use plain language, and I found it very valuable. It's a very specific writing style that helps you be very clear on your content. Um, so you are making it clear to your learners what they need to know and do. Um, and also from the universal design, it is beginning to set things up to make it more readily available for translation and easier for a limited English proficient audience to engage with. Um, so maybe it won't work if you're like in the English department, but for, for I would say for those of us who are more on the technical side of the things on um, the sciences, it could be a very valuable thing to consider. Um, also, as we were looking at some of the bells and whistles in this for and from the UDL lens, we were making sure we chose things that would be um, allow for the greatest accessibility, accessibility for accommodation, such as what we chose for H5P, making sure it was resizable widgets and ensuring we're using the formatting style so for people who are using screen readers. So with that, let's dive in and take a look at a couple things. Um, and if there's specific questions on things you want to see, let me know. And Christine, if you have um, that document I shared with you open, that's going to give you kind of my roadmap. So if we look at the overview of the Master Gardener program section, yep, yeah, um, and look at the module under there, overview of the Master Gardener program. Second one, thank you. Yeah, so we, again, this is in WordPress, no, excuse me, Pressbooks. Um, we really wanted it for the formatting and for it to look nice, but more importantly, we wanted an easy way to use H5P for interaction. We had a clear objective at the top, um, and you scroll down to the bottom. Um, we're trying to also figure out like what works best for some of the interactivity. We're currently being, um, we're piloting this. So down here at the bottom, you see two videos. And what we're trying to do is decide which one works best. So the first one was, is the video embedded in an H5P widget? And as people watch it, which you don't have to hit play, it will have links pop up um, that will prompt the viewer to learn more. Um, or down below is much more of a traditional video. Here's the video, here's the links. So that's one of the things that we're experimenting with. We have a pilot group going through this now and they're trying to tell me which would which do you like, one or two better. Um, Christine, if you can jump to purpose, vision, and values, please. Sure. It's not my I'm intention sorry, my for you to be playing. I say it's not my intention for you to be playing Vanna White, but I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> uh, well, you know, <laughs> it won't be the first time. It won't be the last, Mike. So, uh, I thought value. I opened it. Purpose, values, vision. Yes. Um, My computer gets kind of slow when I'm screen sharing. Yeah. <clears throat> so in this part, you know, this is kind of those value statements that leave some people dry or, you know, that can be dry, but and leave some people just kind of wondering, well, what's the point of this? So what could we do to make this a little bit more interesting? Well, again, with H5P, uh, we chose a widget that allowed for them to click on some really take home points to make it interactive, something a little bit more than just something they read. Um, so they, they have to interact with the content. 
Um, also, if you notice too, we, we, this is something that's resizable. In the lower right-hand corner, for accessibility reasons, you can expand that screen, which that was some of the initial comments we were getting back from our test audience, like, hey, the font's too small. Remember who our target demographic is, mostly retired individuals. Um, so we had to find ways, okay, what's an easy way for us to make it bigger? Um, and also in the beginning of this, and I forget where it was, we're making reference to the Wisconsin idea, which is a really important thing that John presented in the class last year was making that connection. And um, especially for me and as an extension educator, it's something that we really live by. Um, so to have it um, featured in the class um, is important. I think that the, the link got broke, uh, broke, Christine, so we'll need to refix it. I, I noticed that. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, So, and I also just another comment about the H5P and interaction, and I heard it being stated, I heard it stated at the end of your last talk, being consistent. When you get in and you start looking at all the different options that you have for this kind of low stakes, no stakes interactive stuff, there's a lot of options and there, some of them are really cool. But what we wanted to do is settle on, here's the three to five things that work for our audience. They will learn how to use them and they won't have that learning curve every time they run into something like that. Um, again, for the, those who'd be doing this with low digital literacy, we didn't want to introduce a new barrier of them learning technology with every module that they went into. Um, so Christine, if you wanna jump out there, maybe just jump to the quizzes. Sure. <laughs> um, with the quizzes, we're looking to ah. use quizzes in two different ways. Um, one is as a compliance piece in which they will, at the end of a module, they will be prompted with a quiz that says, I have completed and understand this module, and I click this button to verify that I did this. So we have on record that they they have agreed that they that they're agreeing to this they understand it and it gives us the documentation for as a volunteer manager um to say well you know you did say you were not use chainsaws and blow torches while gardening um so you know you said you recognize that so it gives us the ability to come in and and do that um it also gives us the ability to ensure that all volunteers across the state are getting the same orientation and training um, and that if you're up in Superior, up in Douglas County, or you're down in uh, Rock County in Janesville, that this is also guaranteed that they both have the same knowledge and skills and uh, position description scope, and, and they're agreeing to the things, same things. So yeah, it's not a very high-tech way of using this, this first round of quizzes. It's pretty simple. But then we're jumping to the other extreme with quizzes, and this, this is where I could use some help and get pointed into the direction of who, who is our Canvas quiz master. Um, I'm also looking to create a question bank of horticulture questions because the other things that people need to do as they're coming in to our program is demonstrate they have a um, baseline knowledge of horticulture. And they, they can get that training elsewhere. They can get the horticulture content in another online course that we're creating or our traditional face-to-face -face courses. But we need to ensure that all volunteers have that baseline knowledge of horticulture content and the quiz would live in here. And we're trying to make a, a pretty robust question bank that meets all our learning objectives that are in the horticulture class, making sure they have the proper knowledge of uh, plants, of soils, of insects, of disease, and whatnot, and have that tested here. And we'd really like to also be able to reuse that question bank in the other course that we're creating, uh, and, and over there use it as the practice exam questions, so that those who would be taking that separate course, preparing for this one, they can experience all those questions um, through that course, and they'd still be the same questions over here. So we're just making sure that we have a full understanding of all the robustness of Canvas quizzes so we can get full use of that quiz bank from in this course and in that other course. And I think lastly, what I wanna point out, and, and I don't have anything on this, is 
obviously with COVID, there was a lot of changes that we were all having to do to get our courses online. Um, what we were very fortunate with the Master Gardener program is so much of our core content was already done as pre-recorded lectures and we supported a flipped classroom blended model. So people would watch the videos and then show up for class and do something hands-on to reinforce the content. We weren't scrambling to get those, that core, those core lectures online. That was done. Where our scramble was, was getting that traditional, that what was the lab component, that face-to-face -face component adapted. And we did a quick change at the end of last year but now we're moving into um, 2021 with creating a fully online foundations and horticulture class, which utilizes those videos, starts to fold in um, some of this H5P interactivity, reuses the quiz features from Canvas, um, fully utilizes the U uh, UDL concepts because um, we do want more diversity in the program. And, um, you know, we still want to make it fun. Um, so we'll be piloting that course starting in October, and we'll see how that goes. And we also intend for this course, this onboarding course, to open up um, also later this fall in late 2020 for new volunteers as well as our existing volunteers to go through to get through this orientation. Um, but I will have to say, I would have got very little of this done if I was just sitting in my office trying to figure it out. Through the active teaching labs, through this course, through the brainstorming that we did in the uh, Leveraging Tech to Teach classroom space, um, just listening to what other people have done, that really helped me decide what needed to be done, what was best for this course, and how to do it. So. Um, as you go through the course, you know, it's it could be a little different pace for you, but uh, do it with an open mind, listen, network and talk. And you'll not you may find not all bits of it are applicable to you. But take what you can adjust it, play around with it, and you'll probably find most of it will fit your needs for the class um, that you're trying to build. And this is a this is a point that is really like Thank you for saying that. That's a way that I, I would have tried to say something like, not, uh, I guess I probably would have said it similarly. Um, not everything that you learn in this class or everything that you see in this class will apply to your situation. It's really hard to design a class for all of the disciplines in, you know, across the university at different levels, the different types of classes, and including things like Mike presented here for an extension thing where you have a much different learning objectives um, and outcomes for the course, then, you know, I, one, one size will not fit all. So what we do instead is we have sort of general conversations about good pedagogical practices, good teaching and learning practices, um, things like backwards design and frameworks like the Wisconsin experience. And then we say, and talk to each other, getting a set of eyes um, from a different discipline on the course that makes sense to you you'll be able to get some input on, you know, when people say, that, man, that just doesn't make sense to me. And you can say, well, if you were in my discipline, that would make sense. And that could be a perfectly valid answer. But hopefully you'll also say, hmm, are there things that I can do in the course design that will make it accessible to you? And if I do that, will I be opening up the discipline a little bit so that it just doesn't have the same type of people um, succeeding in the course that have always succeeded in the course. Can we open it up a little bit and, and have a little bit more inclusion and diversity in it? All right. Thank you very much for sharing, Mike and Christine. Really appreciate it. Um, any questions from any of the participants? All right. In that case, um, again, Mike and Christine, thank you. You are free to go at this point. Um, safe travels on your way home. Uh, <laughs> thank you. This is the nice thing. This is the nice thing about online uh, remote learning, right? We can just kind of be like, all right, I'm home. Yeah, but it makes around. complaining about your coworkers a little bit more difficult these days. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Thank you. All right.
And I'm going to bring everybody else into, I'm going to share a screen here and bring you all into the um, course overview. So I believe that most of you, as I said, got into the course. And I'm going to bring this up to another window here so that I have a little bit more space. I'm using a laptop and then I've got another laptop, I'm sorry, another uh, desktop monitor above me so that I can get to two different things at once. So if I look like I'm not looking at you anymore, that's why. All right. Um, so on the course overview, I've got a link to a Padlet. And can you all see that? And I want to start off with this conversation. Just go ahead and click on that link in there. Um, I believe you can also do this as an embedded thing. So you can just click within that document as well. Um, and you'll be able to um, click on the plus button there and you'll be able to get to something. So what I want to start to talk about here is, um, and you'll see that my first example is uh, tongue in cheek. Um, just add that as a disclaimer. This is not the philosophy that I'm advocating for. But add a thing below here that says, you know, what is effective learning in your perspective? And we're using Padlet. Padlet is not a UW supported tool, but I'm going to use it anyway. Um, what is efficient learning? And what is efficient teaching? Because the thing that I like to balance here is you, I could have you um, teach you how to do really great, how uh, effective learning courses, um, but you would have no time in your life to live or to balance, you know, the work-life balance would be way off. So part of what I try to do is also say, all right, that's good, but is it worth your time? Um, <laughs> and so we want to have like efficient teaching as well as effective teaching. Um, and then the students, they want efficient learning too, right? How many, you've all been students and you all know the feeling of how do I get this assignment done in the least amount of time with the least amount of effort? It's a game that we play. Once we get really, really passionate about something, then we start saying, huh, I want to go down that rabbit hole and I want to go down that rabbit hole and it becomes less efficient um, and more effective. Um, but that's, you know, once that motivation, that intrinsic motivation kicks in, teaching and learning becomes easy, right? But for a lot of our students, they're not there yet. So they want to figure out how to do stuff efficiently that gets them to that point where they can say, oh, it turns out this is really interesting. I do want to learn more about this. So go ahead and click on that link for the Padlet there. I'm going to put that in the chat as well. And I want you to add stuff to it. And you can start off just by adding, you know, text if you want to. Um, you'll be uh, given a chance to add a title. So if you want to get started, you click on it and you type in a title. Um, John's post is a terrible title. And then I can add some text to John's post. I can go and click on a link and add a link. So if I have a picture and a link, I can add that. I can take a picture of myself and say that um, efficient learning is, is me. Let's see if this will work. I'm just going to click capture and see what happens. All right. That didn't work. Yeah, that didn't work very well. But, and please let me know in chat if you cannot get to this. Because sometimes that happens. And then I start to worry because I'm not seeing anything happen on the screen here. And I think, are they able to do it? Are they just, do they not care? Um, why aren't they doing it? Is anybody there? You might have to click up on the top where it says that the Padlet was updated elsewhere, and then it refreshes the page. Oh, thank you. Let's just go into that Padlet, because it probably is. All 
Oh, look at that. There's so much on there. See, this is brilliant. Thank you for doing that. Um, all right. I appreciate that um, jumping in and, and telling me that because I was not seeing it. So good, experiential learning. We've got a lot there, learning from hands-on experiences and assignments. Um, helping students understand to apply a lot of it, that. It's a very similar to the experiential learning hands-on, experiential, active learning. We're going to talk about the different types of active learning um, from a Chi article that I'm going to have you uh, read about. Um, there's active and there's um, constructive and then there's interactive are the three different levels and interactive is the best and that's the one that we're going to try to do a lot of here but we're also going to do that constructive learning as well. Applying topics to the real world, so authentic topics, that's absolutely true. And as I said in the Active Teaching Lab today, um, we're in a pandemic, and right now, questions about the pandemic are authentic. We are in a time of uh, awakened racial strife, and that is important. We need to be, a, that's an authentic conversation that people are feeling and having right now. We need to be uh, responsive to that. Um, being able to apply principles learned in class to never before seen problems, yes. Um, the idea of transfer, what can I learn here and then transfer to a different situation? Figuring out how the world applies to you and your world. Um, personalized learning is so important and as you come up with your learning outcomes, think about how as a student who's not already, you know, in in indoctrinated into your discipline, what can they pick up on to make your topic um, interesting to their and connected to their passions and interests. Um, exploration, I will, res I will say that 5,000 times this semester. Um, and also being, uh, being safe, um, you know, so we want people to take risks, but we also want them to take, to know that if they fail in those risks, it's gonna be okay, it's no big deal. All right, efficient learning, processing information, organization and schedules. Um, time spent learning instead of figuring out how to learn. All right, and so this is a huge one. And this, as far as Canvas goes and the course that you design, one of the nice things about Canvas is you can't do a lot in it. It's got the red thing on the side. It's got these menu items in there. It kind of looks the same for all of your courses so that when your students join your course, they don't have to refigure out where assignments are. They're here under assignments. So that standardization really helps them not have to spend a lot of time um, on figuring out how to learn connect they can just focus in on all right i know where it is now i can focus on that brilliant example from real life um, daughter's first grade virtual experience Whew. how to make things easy to learn and understand and here's the other thing you can't do that for the students they can do this better for themselves and for each other so ask them to explain to each other. That activates a different part of their brain and it also, you'll learn stuff um, and how to speak in a more relevant language to your students as well. Um, again, multiple means, uh, relevant information um, that, that is, a, is relevant to the assignments. That's another big one, thank you. Scaffolding we're gonna talk about, excellent. Efficient teaching, picking articles, yeah, do we really want to focus in on the, the grammar and whether they have two spaces between a period or not? Maybe we do. Maybe it's an English or literature writing class, and that's important, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's just that they can convey big ideas, uh, complicated ideas simply, and we focus on that. Clear objectives, yes. Uh, communication. Oh, I love it. You guys are already thinking about alignments and expectations and structure and goals, of course, and all of that stuff. This one is super important, especially in the first time that we're doing this right now in uh, a pandemic situation. We're all back at square zero um, and we're learning everything. Multiple approaches. You guys are already great at this. Excellent. I'm going to bring us back to the course right now. 
Any questions as I uh, rotate back? I have a yeah. quick one. When we sign yes. up, when we request the, the sandbox um, for Canvas, it yes. asks us to put in our net ID. Do we also need to put an, an, a net ID for you, or are you going to be going into our Canvas sandbox? Um, you do not need to put in a net ID for me because you will invite me and some of your um, participant peer participants here in this course in as students. So in a sandbox, you don't have to use a register list of whoever's officially registered. You can invite me in as a student. You can invite somebody else in as a co-teacher. There's all kinds of options for that. So just jump in, grab a sandbox to explore, um, and we will start digging into that pretty soon. Thank you. All right. So quick overview um, in the last few minutes that we have here. Um, again, we're building off of the Active Teaching Labs. A couple of years ago, I had students come in and they would demonstrate technologies that, that were used in their disciplines. And they would talk about how they were used and, and wouldn't it be cool if we had another one that could do X, Y, and Z. I mean, it was kind of good, it was kind of bad, because a lot of our students didn't have a lot of experience, so it was kind of hard to do. Um, several of the students started working, coming to the active teaching labs and saying that they were very useful for them. So I said, great, let's just make that an hour of the course. Um, so now you get credit, half credit, I guess, for coming to the active teaching labs and participating in those. And then here's the rest of it. Um, we've got course basics. If you want to read about what my objectives are, a little bit about, about a little bit about me and my vision for the course, they're under there. Um, the course overview is what we just did, that Padlet thing. There's a little bit more in there that we're not going to have time to do today. I, I didn't know how long Mike was going to um, speak for, so we didn't get to everything. And that's okay, because we're going to be flexible. Um, one of my favorite elements is this idea of the good learning principles. So my doctorate was in um, um, curriculum and instruction um, with a minor in educational psychology. And in many ways, everything that I've learned about uh, teaching and learning can be based on this idea of empower students to explore good problems with others that reveal systems. And um, James Paul G will um, show you this in a, a series of videos that are very short videos. Um, and I've arranged them in the course in different ways for you to experience them. So very easy to listen to in ways that I think will make sense, but I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, inclusive teaching, this has been a really big one for me. It started off with Universal Design for Learning, and it, this summer with um, the George Floyd murder and some of the other um, issues, it really, I've started looking at we need to talk about race, we need to talk about inclusion, we need to talk about who is not in our um, disciplines and why, and what can we do to sort of open up space for their voices. I talked a little bit about using frameworks. Um, the Wisconsin experience is one that I think is really important. Um, Mike talked about backwards design and that being really important. I've got some courses, some classes that will just be about you in their building, and if you've run into problems, I've got courses, uh, uh, class times for you to come in and let's work on them together. We'll solve problems together. Castle topping is very uh, quickly, it's the idea of what do the students do before class, what do they do in class, and what do they do after class? Um, a simple concept, but one that will really help you make your course clear and structured for your students. And then another tech help thing. Um, a little bit more on white supremacy and anti-white supremacy stuff. A lot of course building time um, where we get in and really put what we've learned in the first half of the semester into practice there. And I want us to do it together. I want you to be eyes for each other so that what you're building, other people will be able to give you input on and you'll be able to give your ideas and thoughts on their courses. So that interplay of learning from each other. And then the last thing is, um, I'm just going to have you present to your course um, to the class or one or two things that you learn in, in the class. So this is really about you. I recognize it's 301, by the way, and I, I will be more respectful of your time in future classes um, and try to finish up here in the next minute or two. Um, that's basically it. It's going to be about you. It's going to be somewhat 
um, improvisational as we figure out what are the things that you need in your course and how can we help each other achieve those things. Um, there's some structure there with some really good pedagogical elements. It's not a educational jargon course. This is not a, a master's level or doctorate level theory course. Uh, we will have theory, but we will try to immediately apply that theory to the practices specifically in Canvas, recognizing that if you can do it in Canvas, you can do it in Blackboard, um, in Blackboard or Google Classroom or uh, Angel or Sakai or any of the other learning management systems that are out there that you might someday have to teach with. If you design a course here in Canvas, you will be able to export that course and import it into another um, course. And the conceptual work that you do here will apply. That's all I have for today. Um, I invite you to jump in with the course overview and um, uh, the good learning principles uh, and just work through the modules. Um, I'm happy to stick around for the next 15, 20 minutes um, for other individual questions, but otherwise you're all, you're all free to go at this point. And again, next week I will try to um, let you out at three o'clock. Thank you very much. Yulia, go ahead. Um, so this might be a bit of a naive question. Um, I, I was wondering, since we're building a course, like how much detail we're expecting? Like, for example, right. I've only TA'd before. So I would either take a course at TA maybe or something like that. Um, Wonderful. Yeah. So like, do we should like, are we going to be like making the entire syllabus with readings and Beautiful. like writing all the quizzes no. or is it more like conceptual, like this is the type of activity I would do for this topic or this topic? Yes to the latter. So this is again, this is led by you individually. And I do not expect like the course that Mike put together, that is a, he not only worked on the class, on that course in our class, he worked on it as part of his job, right? And he had Christine help him and he had other people help him. And then they worked for another semester after that to make it polished. So that was way far and above what you, what's reasonable. If you have a class that's already done and you just want to tweak it a little bit, that sure, then you can include the readings because they're already chosen. Um, if you want to design a class from scratch, sort of your dream class, you don't have to do the whole thing and figure it out right now. But if you can figure out sort of a rough schedule of it, a structure of it, if you can put together a couple of activities, that's fine. You don't have to do everything. You could just do a couple of different things. Mm -hmm. uh, Vivian asked a question, can we use this course we're building as our Delta practicum? I do not know the answer to that. I think the answer is yes, but I don't know enough about the requirements for the practicum to be able to answer that question. Um, Devin Wixon and uh, Jessica Mayer would be able to help you figure that out. And I think there's somebody else in that office that I don't remember their name right now. So that's the best answer that I have right now for that, Vivian. Um, so good. Um, there will be a lot of experimentation in this course. Um, so some things that I'm going to demonstrate, for example, the readings for the good learning principles. I've got a couple of them as pages. I've got a couple of them as quizzes. Um, I've got one as a, a, a graded survey rather than a quiz. So there are different ways to present that information. Um, there are readings. Uh, for some things, I'm going to have you just go out and find on your own um, your best experiences. I think I've got discussions for the first couple of weeks. And that's just to start to get to know everybody. Um, and to prompt you to go out and start looking for things. All right. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you all for coming today. And again, you're free to go, but I'm also going to stick around for a few more minutes until you all go. So if you're going to leave, don't wait for me to kick you out because I'm going to stick around for questions. <laughs>